Our message today is called Last Generation, Fact and Fiction. Let's pray. Lord, we pray you'll bless us now with open ears and open hearts so we can hear what the Spirit is saying to the church today. I pray, Lord, that you would uh, just make sure that uh, your Spirit attends the Word, especially the Scriptures that we're reading today, and uh, speak them into our hearts. Jesus said, the words I speak to you, they are Spirit and they are life. And we're reminded that we are to receive the ingrafted word which is able to save our souls. And man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God abides forever. By the word of your mouth were the heavens made, all the host of them, by the breath of your mouth. You spoke and it was done, you commanded and it stood fast. We pray you'll speak here today to us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. <clears throat> well, there seems to be a bit of a debate over uh, several issues that all kind of relate to uh, one central issue, that being what is the experience and what are the characteristics of the people of God who are going to be alive on the earth when Jesus finally returns often referred to as the final or the last generation. Now, there is something that is being called last generation theology, or LGT, purportedly speaks to the experience and the characteristics of the last generation. And there are people, both living and dead, that are being called adherence of last generation theology by a growing segment within our church. And so I just want to share with you, based on the study that I've done, the research that I've done, my assessment of LGT or last generation theology might be a, it seems like it might be a classic case of uh, terms that are not clearly defined, words and expressions sometimes taken out of context, assumptions are often made, and people could be fairly or unfairly characterized lim uh, based on a limited information or an incomplete set of facts. And this happens all the time, not only on issues like this, but any issue you might want to pick, I guess, we have this tendency. So my first piece of advice for all of us this morning is talk to people. Okay? Is that, is that easy enough? We need to talk to people. And we need, when we talk to people, we need to try to really understand what they are saying and, and then really try to understand what they mean by what they are saying. Don't make assumptions. Uh, don't jump to conclusions. For some of us, the only exercise we get is jumping to conclusions. And then, as Paul said, we need to study to show ourselves approved unto God as workmen or workwomen who don't need to be ashamed because we are rightly dividing the word of truth. What do you say? We need to do that. My second piece of advice when it comes to this particular issue is don't, don't allow yourself to be labeled if you can avoid that. Don't allow somebody or, or some group to uh, define you. So if somebody says, hey, are you LGT? <laughs> you got to be careful, I guess, with that. <laughs> are, well, if they say, are you last generation theology? If I were you, I wouldn't say yes and I wouldn't say no. I would ask them, what do you mean? by that. Does that make sense? What do you mean by that? Ask for clarity. Ask, can we define the terms? Can we define the expressions? And then I think we need to try to understand them, and then we need to try to be understood. Then whoever you're inter interacting with and talking with, I think you should try to wrestle together with God in prayer, for light 
for truth, for direction. You know what they did, our early Adventist pioneers? They started with the, pr the premise that Christ is not divided. And starting with the premise that Christ is not divided, then if they saw that they were divided, and they were divided oftentimes on different doctrinal points and issues, then they prayed together. They prayed together until God gave them unity and harmony on doctrines and theology. That's how that happened. Prayer for unity. You see, Satan is trying to divide us anywhere he can at any opportunity. And so we have to resist that, right? Paul said we must endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Interesting, he used the word endeavor. Being unified takes effort. It's easy to be divided, isn't it? It's very easy to be divided. But being unified takes effort. It takes work to get united and to stay united. And so let's not mimic the cancel culture that's all around us today, labeling one another, dissing one another. Let's not insulate ourselves, get in an echo chamber, and close the door to the possibility that somebody might actually have something to say that we should take the time to hear. So, <clears throat> in that vein, I hope that my message today can be a step in the direction of unity on this important point of the experience and the characteristics of the end-time saints here on earth. Now, the debate uh, surrounding the last generation revolves around questions like these. So I want you to listen carefully. Is the experience of the final generation unique in the history of God's people on earth? Is it unique? Do the final generation of saints play a part in bringing an end to the great controversy between Christ and Satan? Do the end-time saints in some way vindicate God and His character and His law before the world and before the universe? Do they go through the time of trouble, as it's called, without an intercessor? And do they reach a state of sinless perfection before Jesus comes? So questions like those are driving the debate. Now, the first thing I want to say is that it is actually a given that there will be a final generation. Do you believe that? There must be some saved people that are alive on earth when Jesus comes. In fact, uh, Paul describes them here when he says in 1 Thessalonians 4.17, Then we that are what? Alive and remain. There they are. They're going to be caught up together with the resurrected saints in the clouds to meet the Lord up in the air. Now, the prophet Elijah in the Old Testament was a type of this final generation because Elijah, we know, was taken up to heaven in a whirlwind without ever tasting death. And there was another man. What was his name? Enoch, right? Enoch was translated to heaven. He walked with God, and then God took him, exempting Enoch from death and the resurrection. So we have, biblically speaking, we have two men, only two men who had a last generation experience. These two men, Elijah and Enoch alone, cheated death and avoided the grave, experiencing translation too. But, according to Paul, there is going to be a generation of translated people. When Jesus comes, thousands, millions, tens of millions. And so that is something very unique in history, at least in terms of the numbers, wouldn't you say? So yes, there is a final generation of saints on earth when Jesus comes, but... What will be the experience and what will be the characteristics of this sizable group that Paul spoke of right there? What will be the characteristics? Well, let's see what the Bible has to say. 
In Revelation 12, 17, that uh, Tino read earlier, it says, The dragon was wroth with the woman, went to make war with the, what's the word? Remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, you see the word remnant there? That is a Greek, it comes from a Greek word, loipoi. Everybody say, loipoi. Loipoi. What does it mean? It means the remaining ones or the residue. So this verse is clearly talking about what's left of God's people at the very end, the final generation. What do we know about them? Well, first off, we know they are the object of Satan's wrath. The devil has it in for them. Number two, they keep the commandments of God, which I think explains Satan's anger because he began his rebellion in heaven with the argument that God's commandments cannot be kept. And here, these people are keeping those commandments. <clears throat> Number three, it says the remaining ones, the residue, the remnant, have the testimony of Jesus Christ. And what is that? What is that? What is the testimony of Jesus Christ? Well, Revelation 19.10 says it is the spirit of prophecy. Spirit of prophecy. So the final generation, they have the distinct advantage of knowing the future before it happens. They, in essence, possess Satan's playbook as they anticipate the great coming spiritual conflict that awaits them. Now, they won't just have the commandments of God and the spirit of prophecy. They will keep them. And so, guided by God's word, guided by prophecy, they will be fully obedient to God's will. What do you say? They will know the truth, and they will live up to the truth that they know. They will know the truth, and they will live the truth that they know. Revelation 14, 12 says, here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So, the word patience there means perseverance, or they will persevere through great trials and great, great difficulties in the last days. They will be trusting in Christ and His perfect righteousness, the faith of Jesus and faith in Jesus. So, while they keep the commandments of God, their faith is in the righteousness of Christ. Amen? That's what they believe in. It's Christ's perfect record. It's Jesus' sinless life that qualifies them for a place in the kingdom. When they receive his righteousness as a gift, they take his righteousness, they receive the gift, and as their sins are laid on Christ and he was treated as they deserve, his righteousness is laid on them, and they are being treated as he deserves. And so we would say that they are justified by faith in the righteousness of Christ that is imputed to them, and they are also sanctified by faith in the righteousness of Christ that is actually imparted to them. And that experience is described here in Revelation 7, verses 2 and 3. John says, I saw another angel, and he was ascending from the east, having the what? Seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given, to hurt, not to hurt the earth, the sea, or the trees, until we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. So, friends, will the final generation, before all the winds of strife begin to really blow, will the final generation be sealed? Yes or no? Yes, that's what it says, right? They will be sealed in their what? Foreheads. Now, we are told, a spirit of prophecy, that the sealing is a settling into the truth so they cannot be moved. A settling into the truth so they cannot be moved. Remember, before he comes... Before Jesus says, I'm coming quickly, he says, they that are holy, let them be holy still. They that are righteous, let them be righteous still. And so they are sealed in a state of righteousness before Jesus comes. 
In Testimonies for the Church, volume 5, page 53, it says, quote, Those who would rather die than perform a wrong act are the only ones who will be found what? Faithful. Think about that. Those who are willing to die rather than perform a wrong act. Who does that make you think of? That makes me think about Joseph. Remember Joseph with Potiphar's wife? Being tempted with a temptation that has made the downfall of millions of male men down through the centuries. And what did Joseph say? He said, how could I commit this great sin against God? And he fled, and he was put in prison for many years as a result of his resisting that temptation. But I would suggest that Joseph was preferring to die than commit a wrong act. What about you? Revelation 14.1 says, I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written in their forehead. Now this Chapter 14, verse 1, introduces us to a special group. What are they called? The 144,000. And who's 144,000? They are the final generation, right? They are the last generation of saints on earth alive when Jesus comes. Now, it says they have the Father's name in their foreheads. We just read in chapter 7, they are sealed in their foreheads. Now we know they are sealed with the Father's name, and that represents God's character. So they have God's character in their minds. They, they think God's thoughts after him. They have experienced the fullness of the new covenant where God says, I will remind, write my laws where? In their hearts and in their minds. Revelation 14.3 says, this 144,000, <clears> and by the way, whether that's a literal number or a symbolic number is a subject for another sermon, but uh, I always say whether it's literal or symbolic, I believe it's symbolic, but whatever it is, like the song says, oh, when the saints, oh, when the saints, oh, when the saints go marching in, I want to be in that number, right? Now, it says... <clears throat> that they sing a, what kind of song? A new song. Before the throne and before the beasts and the elders. <clears throat> and this is actually a song they're going to sing when they get to heaven. And it says, No man could learn that song except the 144,000 which were redeemed from the earth. So they're going to sing a new song because it's reflective of the experience that only they went through of living on earth through the events of the last days just before Jesus returns. Now it goes on in verse 4 to say that these are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. Now if you look in Revelation, the, the women in Revelation that people are defiled by are fallen churches. Remember, women represent churches and prophecies. So these are fallen churches that have corrupted people by false doctrines and practices. But these living saints, these 144,000, they are not defiled. They have not been corrupted in their beliefs or their practices by uh, the harlot women symbolized in the book of Revelation. So their doctrines will be pure as will their lives be pure. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are the pure in heart. What's their reward? They will see God. And friends, those that see God coming and are alive when he comes, they are going to be pure in heart. Uh, John brings this out in his other, one of his other books in the Bible. Beloved, he says, now are we the children of God, it has not yet been revealed, he says, what we shall be, but we know that when he, Jesus, is revealed, we will be what? Like him. We will see him as he is. And then he says, everyone that has this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. 
Also in Revelation 14, 4, it says, These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. So these people know where Jesus is, and they know what he's doing, and they follow him, and they benefit from all he's doing at every step and stage of his work for their salvation. So, do they follow him to his death on the cross? What do you think? Yes. Do they follow him uh, to his burial in the grave? Do they follow him to his resurrection from the dead? They follow him to his ascension up to heaven. They follow him as their high priest into the most holy place of heaven's sanctuary. They follow him as their high priest to the most holy place of heaven's sanctuary. And then they follow him as he returns to receive them to himself. So where he is, there they may be also. They follow the lamb, what? Wherever he goes. Now, I probably don't need to tell you that most Christians today follow Jesus to the cross, but really not further than that. But the final generation will follow Christ wherever he goes, and since they are alive at the end, they must follow him by faith into the most holy place for the judgment, their sins are confessed, and their sins are blotted out while they are living still upon the earth. And friends, that will be an amazing experience, won't it? How many can, can, can call one of your sins to mind right now? And with that recollection, what do we have? Shame, regret, guilt, sorrow. But when your sins are blotted out in the sanctuary above, You'll have a, a, a deep sense of unworthiness, but not able to call a single sin to mind. Won't that be wonderful? And that's what will happen to these people before Jesus comes. In uh, The Great Controversy, page 488, it says, quote, The subject of the sanctuary and the investigative judgment should be clearly understood by the people of God. All need a knowledge for themselves of the position and the work of their great high priest. Otherwise, it will be impossible for them to exercise the faith which is essential at this time or occupy the position which Christ designs for them to fill. So I hope you can see, based on that, that before Jesus comes, we're going to have to occupy a position that God wants us to fill, and it's going to take a faith, a faith that follows Jesus as our high priest and understands his work of erasing our sins from the record and blotting them out in the judgment. Revelation 14, 4 goes on to say, These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits to God, and the lamb. Uh, the word redeemed means that they've been purchased. And they've been purchased with the infinite price of Christ's life that he paid for them on the cross. They are called first fruits to God and the lamb. Now, when you read the Bible, is there anything special about the first fruits? Hmm? Yeah, the word first fruits conveys the idea of something that is, this is a hard word to say, peculiarly, yeah, peculiarly devoted or consecrated to God. That's what first fruits means. It means in a special, significant way, they are consecrated or dedicated to God. Verse 5. In their mouth was found no guile. They are without fault before the throne of God. Who are we talking about here? It's still talking about the 144,000, isn't it? In the context, yes. So they have no guile in their mouths. <clears throat> uh, James, in chapter 3, verse 2, says, If any man offends not in what? Word, the same as a perfect man. And so as we're striving for maturity, 
in our spiritual lives, we ought to be keeping a watch on our what? Our mouths, right? Because that's the way we most easily offend. That's, that's the way we most easily break the law of God, don't we? With our mouths. And so if we can master that by the grace of God, James calls it a perfect man. Now, the 144,000, it says, have no guile in their mouths, right? So they're not offending with their words. The last generation, I guess, will be like George Washington. What did he say? I cannot, I cannot tell a lie. I don't know if that's a myth or a legend, but, you know, you've heard it. But it will be true of the last generation. They cannot tell a lie. And they would rather die than tell a lie. And as it says in the Psalms, they will swear even to their own hurt. We just read the first five verses of Revelation 14. And all those verses describe this final generation here that we just read. But it's very interesting that if you keep reading the proclamation of the three angels. Okay, so the next five verses, so the first five verses of Revelation 14 describe the final generation. The next five verses, guess what? Contain the message that the final generation will be giving to the world. What do you say? And we call those the three angels' messages. Here they are. Then, after seeing the final generation, describing them as we read, then John says, I saw another angel, means messenger or message, flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God, give glory to him. The hour of his judgment has come. And worship him who made heaven, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. And another angel followed, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she has made all the nations drink the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast in his image, receives his mark in his forehead or hand, he himself will also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation, tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and the presence of the Lamb. And so Revelation 14, 6 to 10, contains a special message that the world has not heard but needs to hear just before Jesus returns, and these are the messengers who give this message. And so what is it? The last generation is going to preach the everlasting gospel in all the world. Amen? Do you believe that? Is that going to happen, really? Come on. Is it going to happen? Yes, it says the whole world is going to hear the everlasting gospel of Jesus and salvation by grace through faith in Him. They also are going to be giving glory to God in the hour of God's judgment. Amen? Yes. They are going to be worshiping the Creator, honoring the Sabbath as the one who made heaven, the earth, the sea, and all that in them is. They are going to come out of Babylon and decry the fall of Babylon. They are going to warn the world of the beast, the image of the beast, and the mark of the beast, and they themselves will be victorious over the beast, over the image, and over the mark, according to Revelation 15, where John saw them standing in the sea of glass, having the harps of God. Does the last generation have a special experience that no other generation has had or will have? Well, I'll let you be the judge, based on the scriptures we've just read. But as you're making up your mind, let me just remind you, we'll go back to that word remnant. Remember that one in our scripture reading? Well, if you look at Revelation 12, 17, and uh, you look at that word remnant, and you get Thayer's Greek lexicon of English and Greek, because what Thayer did, he wrote the book in 18... 41, which is interesting timing, uh, but it's got 5,000 entries of a very, they call it a magnificent achievement, took 
three decades for him to put this book together. It's almost like something like Strong's Concordance. But what he did is he really got delved down deep into the meaning of the Greek words of the New Testament. And something I appreciate about what Thayer did is he, he looked not only at the use of the Greek words in the Bible, but he looked at the way people use Greek speaking or writing in language outside the Bible. And when he put those all together, and he looked at that word loipoi, here's what he says in his lexicon. He said it means the rest of any number or class under consideration with a certain distinction and what? Contrast. So he's telling us it seems like the word remnant that we have read for years in Revelation 12, 17, oh yeah, remnant, we know remnant, that's what's left at the end, and it's true, <clears throat> but he's telling us here, it's pointing not only to the people of God who are left on the earth, but to their distinctiveness in contrast to all of God's people that will make up his kingdom. Now, given that the final or last generation will be distinctive, and a bit of a contrast, back to our questions. Does the final generation reach some spiritual state that other generations have not reached? Do they play a part in bringing an end to the great controversy between Christ and Satan? Do they in some way vindicate God and his character and his law before the world and the universe in the judgment? Do they go through the time of trouble without an intercessor? Do they reach a state of sinless perfection before Jesus comes? Is the atonement for sin complete or still ongoing, depending on the experience of this last generation? Well, those are the questions we're going to take up next week. Okay, so I don't have time to go into all of that right now, but I want to leave it there for now, and we'll take it up again next week with Final generation, last generation, fact and fiction as we continue on. But for now, I think we can thank God that he will have a people on earth in the last days that do in fact match the description that we find throughout the book of Revelation, especially chapter 7, chapter 12, and chapter 14. Amen? Father in heaven, we thank you for helping us to do this journey through the scriptures today as we've taken on a topic that is uh, being debated now, and uh, we're all needing to be able to make up our minds about the truth of these issues. And so we just thank you, Lord, that you've not left us in the dark, that we are standing in bright light that is shining from your word, and we trust that you'll help us, Lord, to uh, receive the light, walk in the light, and be children of light. We also pray, Lord, that as a people here as a church, a congregation in Carmel, that we'll be able to talk to each other and listen to each other and respect one another and be civil, and that we could even pray together and seek you and wrestle with you for the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. We ask you, Lord, to give us the experience of our pioneers who did such a great work in praying carefully through the Scriptures to come up with a message, a doctrine, a set of beliefs that hold us together to this day. And as we near the end, Lord, we pray that you'll help us to resist every effort of Satan to divide and that he will be defeated by our um, uh, dependence upon you and your truth and your grace to resist him and to seek instead the unity that only you can give. So bless us to that end is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. And now to him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to his power that works in us. To him be glory in the church, by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, 
and the world without end. Amen. Amen. From generation to generation, passed down through every age, there's a story of a Savior whose love will never change. All creation will bow before Him, every tongue will praise His name. Until the day he comes again, we will say, you are worthy.